Isn't it fun to get a history lesson? Who knew history could be so fun? But I want to, um, one of the things I charged you with up front was to think not only about what are you learning from our history, but how can we use what we've learned to move forward. And I want to start us off with a question, and then I'll turn it over to the, to the rest of you to ask questions. Um, you know, it's a remarkable history. You think back to 1979, uh, your early days in, with the advertisers, and 22 years of California literacy. But what's also remarkable is that we're still here able to talk about it, that it has continued, that it has sustained. And Susan, I think when you were wearing your PLA hat, you charged us to make literacy a core service of the library, implying that we still have a ways to go. So I want to, uh, I want to ask you, um, and I want to, want to get very specific, I think you touched on some of these things, but I want to ask you all, I'm from Texas now, you can tell. Um, I want to ask y'all, what would be a, a three-point strategy for embedding literacy services as a core service of the library? So, you know, I don't have a three-point strategy, uh, strategy there, Taylor, yet. Uh, I'm thinking three points, three points. But uh, something that I didn't mention, uh, but I, I'd like to share it with all of you, and it, this, is, it, this is to some extent a work in progress. Um, I became state librarian about two and a half years ago. And um, not to, I, I'm not a person who, who particularly wants to have initiatives associated with my name in particular, but I was very interested in trying to um, look at early learning efforts. And I think, in fact, our California State Library was a little bit behind on that. So we have started an early learning initiative here in California, and we have a lot of public libraries that were quite far along on that. But one of the things that I wanted to see happen, and this, this was me, this was, you know, the state librarian micromanaging there, the programs. I guess that's what they tell us to do, right, right, Gary? That's right. Okay. Uh, what I wanted to try to do was to take advantage of the capacity we had in our literacy programs and blend that with the capacity that we had in our children's services programs. Because here we, we're hearing all this great information about how the parents function relates directly to how the child functions, and we know that's really important in early literacy efforts. So in our California State Library program that we're, we're seeding here, we are asking uh, in our early literacy uh, libraries to have a partnership with their adult literacy and their children's services. And I've worked in all size, sizes and shapes of libraries, and I often see valiant literacy efforts and great children's efforts, and they're not talking to each other. And it's not, it's not building on the capacity that we have in these institutions. So one of the ways um, that I would address your question was, how can you uh, determine what you're already doing? How, how can you increase your capacity in your library or po possibly just you know, making sure that you're part of all the literacy coalitions or activities going on in your particular community? But in our case here in California, and I think that the success is yet to be determined. It's a work in progress. But in all our libraries that are partnering with our early learning initiative, they're doing that, partnering with their children's uh, services and their adult literacy services. Gary, I just want to ask a, a follow-up question to that because I think you touched on um, how you were challenging libraries to think outside of traditional roles and that in doing that, the literacy programs began to engage the public in new ways and that ultimately allowed you to bring other issues before the legislature because of the relationships that, that were built. How can we then build on that, that capacity and taking what Susan was saying about looking internally at what those relationships are, um, and I believe you even mentioned that what can libraries learn from, from their literacy programs? I, I think one of the, the real challenges that libraries have in uh, this day and age is to recognize and realize that they are not an island unto themselves. Uh, libraries are seldom the singular answer to all of the community's problems. But libraries can be an incredible force in helping communities identify and solve problems. And that I think that's a different way of looking at it. Uh, I, even in my current position, I'm looking at how does the library impact the life of the campus. Not, we, we always felt everybody should just come to us and support us and love us. I mean, 
we, we felt that way in public libraries, you know, the community should just accept us. We're, we're there. And what the taxpayers' revolt in this state made very clear is that people did indeed love libraries. It's just that politicians weren't ready to set them as a priority higher than their own salaries. <laughs> as a priority higher than police and fire. As a, a priority higher than clean water. And when you have constrained resources in the community, uh, those are real issues. But the library, as a partner in a new context, a new sense, can look at water quality issues, at, say, at community safety, at uh, a, a more uh, robust learning environment uh, that is the community. Uh, one of the initiatives that we started in Queens just as I was uh, uh, leaving for UCLA and has now been funded by an NSF grant is looking at how the library children's services could partner with the library's families program, with museums, and with colleges to introduce and create a new kind of children's services that built on the incredible capacity that we had been working with with literature and literacy into science and math. Uh, and the other thing that we began to recognize very clearly is that families used libraries in those communities, which is very different than a lot of places. But the particular tradition and culture there was very fa So we could do other kinds of things. And so the challenge, I think, is, is, is one of how do you place the library as a key player and a key partner in the community, not the singular answer. And too often we have approached it as, you know, libraries are the answer to everything. Uh, we once, I once did an article uh, that I entitled, uh, Literacy is the Answer. Now, what was the question? <laughs> you talked about relationships, and I, I want to um, pose a, a question to you, Bob, about um, how do we move beyond the point where um, these services take place because of the strength of personality of an individual uh, either a charismatic individual or someone that's just a workaholic. Um, and, and I heard this story just last night. A woman said the library she had left had dropped their literacy program because she was no longer there. Well, um, uh, I was thinking about your first question, and it does relate here. There are three things that I think that the library community <coughs> needs to do with respect to literacy. First is that we need to establish advancing literacy and document advancing literacy as a core mission for public libraries. It has to be a core mission for the institution. Uh, secondly, we need to steep ourselves in an understanding of learning. Libraries are educational institutions and librarians are educators. But as one higher education official asked me one time, well, if librarians are educators, what do they teach? Well, we can define that. And we have to be able to stand up and not back away from our role in education and our role as educators. So that means being knowledgeable about learning and what role librarians and libraries can play in advancing <coughs> learning and literacy. And finally, as Gary was suggesting, we need to partner with other organizations. There are um, businesses in your community that are really concerned about adult literacy issues, are willing to partner with you to sponsor adult literacy programs. Uh, most local literacy programs are sponsored by what are called local education agencies. And I refer you to a recent survey by uh, Educational Testing Service, ETS, has done a major survey of literacy providers as well as learning. It's a really good beginning source for understanding uh, learning for adults and for understanding who provides adult education services in uh, this country. Um, but what they were saying is that we need more organizations uh, involved in sponsoring local adult education programs and libraries are in a unique position to either sponsor a program 
or partner with an existing program uh, to make it healthier and more vibrant. I believe we have microphone runners, so if you would just indicate if you have a question for our panel, and Valerie will magically appear. Yes. Hi. Um, I've got a daunting task. Um, a few years ago, we had a, a director who killed our literacy program, and I've got to start it from scratch, not only uh, adult literacy, but also especially for immigrant communities. Do you have some suggestions for readings from, you know, reading material for me to really just begin from the rock bottom on how to um, find out what the needs are and target them and, and create and develop a program from scratch. You contact the ALA office. Which state are you in? I won't ask you which yeah. city. <laughs> North Dakota. Uh, contact the state library, but also contact the, um, uh, the ALA office for literacy services. They have tremendous resources right on the website. There are tremendous services and support issues there. Look at the California Literacy yeah. site. Look at our There's website. There's all kinds of resources on that website. Uh, contact the Queens Library or New York Public or Brooklyn. All three have, uh, they, they, they approach, uh, each of the three uh, big libraries in New York City approach this very differently. We had learning centers. The New York Public Library has reading and writing centers. Uh, Brooklyn embeds it very differently. Uh, there are a variety of models, um, and uh, you know your best talent are the librarians on your own staff, and they're thinking of what will they support now in a new sense in moving forward. Look for your community coalitions. Who's already providing literacy in your community, if anyone? Um, get to know them and find out what is already there and define what your niche is going to be. I went through that series of, of levels. You can start immediately by just amassing collection and beginning to get people uh, talking about it and build that local community coalition that begins to help you define what the library role is going to be. And make sure that you've got the support of your board of trustees and whatever elected officials. Uh, I had the pain of watching three jurisdictions, city councils in this state when I was state librarian vote not to have public library literacy services. That it would not be the they it would not happen in their city. They didn't have illiterates there, and they they said that in council meetings and they took the votes that way. I had a city council member in Queens um, from one of our most challenged areas of the borough say to me that he did not support or believe that we ought to be teaching. That wasn't the role we were to provide good books for people to read, and he was an avid library user. So there, know who your supporters and who your enemies are, or who your detractors are. Well, I guess I wouldn't call them enemies. It wasn't clear to me from the question whether you were asking about technical advice on starting a literacy program or whether you were asking advice on how to overcome barriers to starting a literacy program. The first. Okay. There's another resource that you should be familiar with, and that's uh, it used to be on the ProLiteracy website, but it's now on Verizon Literacy oh, yeah, Network. Verizon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a major, major mm -hmm. resource for assistance from locating programs that are close to you that you might visit and get uh, advice from, but all kinds of other resources about literacy programs as well. Verizon Literacy, uh, Verizon literacy Network. Thank you. And I suspect by noon you'll be saying, noon tomorrow you'll be saying, enough, I can't handle anymore. <laughs> yes. Uh, if you were going to start a local support group like Friends of Literacy in uh, your community library, uh, how would you proceed? Who would you talk to? Um, how would you go about it? Can I take that a uh, stab at that one? Um, I think that is a fabulous idea. Um, depending on where you are in your position in the organization, though, I, I would want to make sure that you check that out with your uh, administrator and you looked you know you took a, a look at what other support groups there are on behalf of your library most libraries at least in California have some kind of a friends group or a foundation and in some situations we've seen a variety of, of kind of versions arise in some situations the literacy program has its own uh, support group in others it's part of the larger support group of the friends or in case if you have a foundation 
foundation might be very willing to take on the literacy program and try to find, assist you in finding private funds. And it's a great way to go. I would just really um, ask that you kind of look at the bigger picture of support in your community. And there might be other nonprofit community foundations that would want to take on your program. Uh, aside from other library efforts that you have, that having done library and literacy fundraising for many years, um, we have lots of, of eager, great folks out there, but we need to be delivering a consistent message. And you don't want to get in a situation where you have more than uh, one message or you have groups asking, several groups asking the same, uh, you know, the same potential donor, but it's a great idea to do that. It's a way to raise community vi visibility and support. I really support what Susan is saying. The, the other factor is that the worst service I believe you can do in a library literacy program is segment your adult <coughs> learners off by themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, find those kinds of mechanisms uh, in terms of advocacy. We found that in our trips to Albany, for example, about half of the five buses we would take up every year were adult learners fighting for basic library budgets learning how to be advocates. When we did the, the write letters to legislators here in California, it was the adult learners that showed up on the steps of the state buildings in Los Angeles and San Francisco using their new writing skills to write on behalf of libraries. And as a result, libraries could see the benefit and could take advantage of, uh, of then put, putting some of that money back into the local literacy programs. The, I, I think the, the biggest mistake a library can make is separating that out and trying to do it, you know, that's your budget. And if you don't raise it, we're going to cut you out. Rather than it, as, as Bob says, it's a core program and everybody in the library has a responsibility for making sure it survives. I would assume that if you're starting a Friends of, uh, of Literacy program, um, that you are going to be reaching outside mm -hmm. the normal library community to do that. And that's going to mean that, first of all, you've got to, as Gary was saying earlier, you've got to know the demographics of your community. Why is it important for your community to have this support group for literacy services? Second, you've got to marshal your argument so that you can give a clear and sound rationale for why uh, this program uh, is important. And then reach out to people in various sectors of your community, the business community, the education community, the, uh, the civic uh, community like League of Women Voters and organizations like that, Rotary uh, organizations that are concerned about the health of the community. So those are the three things that I would suggest. If I could add into that, um, one of the best places to get recruits, might say for your literacy program council, is retired teachers associations, Delta Kappa Gamma, American Association of University Women, as well as the League of uh, Women Voters. Uh, not to put the men down, but women are the ones who generally start teaching the kids and reading to them, and they're strong advocate of education. So these are great places to go to build your private councils. One of the great partners here in California has always been the California Reading Association, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are <clears throat> tremendous people in, in support. Yes. We've built in a 15-minute break, but I can make a deal with you. We can take a couple more questions if you can stick to a 10-minute break. Do we have any other questions for our panelists? Could um, any of you or all of you comment on the role of um, philanthropic institutions in supporting literacy, especially in your experience, and uh, where you found them helpful and where you found them uh, perhaps uh, challenging or difficult or hurdles, in fact, and, uh, you know, uh, particularly like community foundations? Uh, community foundations are great. Uh, we had a, an early collaboration with the Bank of America, who, uh, uh, for the campaign, through the foundation at the State Library, created a series of checks, and we got, I think it was either 50 cents or 75 cents on the sale of every one of those. And we, we got something like $100,000 over a three-year period that we then in turn dispersed out to local libraries. Uh, I would comment on... Uh, the challenge that poses of your ethics, because uh, I found, uh, I, I, and I don't know what's happened since, but I made the 
not very popular decision, along with others, to not accept support from Coors uh, for the California Literacy Campaign. And it was really because of talking with a lot of uh, our providers, uh, the local programs, uh, who made it very clear to me, and I hadn't realized it, that a large number of the adult learners in the program, uh, programs across the state of California, were recovering substance abusers. And that by accepting that money and putting that name on the California Literacy Campaign, we would be sending a very mixed message to uh, many of our adult learners. And I got into very large hot water with the governor's office and with others who just didn't, until we sat down and could explain the rationale for our decisions. It didn't make it any easier with a lot of legislators for whom these were big donors. And why were we turning down uh, money uh, and potential support? And so the, the philanthropic side is, is one that you begin to get into occasionally if you have partners coming to the table that might not be your best partners. And so be very, and think about that up front because it, uh, you know, a Monday morning quarterbacking after having released uh, your name. Uh, and I guess that's the other piece that I would say is that your name mm -hmm. and the reputation of being a public library has incredible value in uh, particularly large marketing campaigns. That was what the Ad Council taught us mm -hmm. uh, back when, was yes. that that association uh, libraries were positive images, and you have to be extremely cautious, I think, and others have disagreed with me, and that's just fine, but that's the rationale behind why we, we chose some partners and not others. There's a, there's a very fundamental um, uh, concern that I have about philanthropic organizations currently. Um, at the local level, for example, in Onondaga County, which is the county uh, where Syracuse, New York, is located, the Community Foundation um, has made a, a, a five-year and now extended a, a seven-year commitment to supporting literacy activities. But what tends to happen with both local uh, uh, philanthropic organizations and national philanthropic organizations is that they tend to focus almost exclusively on children. And in doing so, they don't recognize the important component of adult uh, literacy and adult education. So that would be the barrier. You've got to really get them to understand that you can never have a completely successful uh, program to advance children's literacy without a companion adult literacy program. Uh, and that's an area where pro-literacy is working now and trying to convene a forum of ma representatives of major foundations because these smaller uh, foundations follow the lead of the larger ones. And I want to convene this forum to get them to understand how important adult literacy is uh, to our country today. Well, I would just like to add that, that on the local level, I think, in your community, your city, your county, you, uh, you know, your program or, or your library or your institution has prob probably a very clear knowledge and a good working relationship with some of your potential private funders. So I think we get into more problematic areas if we're looking at a larger national or statewide scale. I think in your community you cannot, um, you don't want to overlook the private support at all. I think in many of our local programs they're u using all kinds of private support here in California and as well as, as dollars, I know we're leveraging a lot of in-kind support when you have events and you have all your local vendors. I know Starbucks is a Starbucks, okay, everybody may have an, you know, their view of Starbucks, but they're huge. I mean, they provide you know, beverages and all kinds of in-kind support for events. So I think there are many different ways you can leverage your private partners, uh, and in some cases you won't necessarily get into to some of the issues of are they branding you or, or are they asking you to somehow modify your program because that's something you absolutely do not want to do. But I would not overlook the, the possibilities that you have in your private funders at the local level. But, but also remember in connection with what Susan just said, as Willie Sutton said when they asked him why did he rob banks, he said because that's where the money is. The money is in the hands of private individuals. Mm -hmm. And there are always private individuals locally 
who may be interested in supporting programs like this. And that's why the connection to community foundations is, can be yes. really useful. Yeah. We have much to talk about, clearly, and we have the rest of today and tomorrow morning to continue this conversation. I want to thank the, uh, the trailblazers. What an honor it is to have them here, their early leadership, that we are able to follow their paths and to build on what we've learned from them. So thank you to our, our panel, and we will... Re